All right, welcome everybody and happy Earth Day. I'm so glad that you could join us. My name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. And tonight we're really excited to be able to host contributors uh, to Deviant Haulers, Queer Appalachian Ecologies for a Sustainable Future, um, which is uh, a new collection from uh, University Press of Kentucky. So just a little bit of background, Firestorm is uh, an almost 16 year old radical bookstore owned uh, and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature books and events that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. So this book is extremely on point. Uh, we're also continuing to do a lot of our book events online, um, both because we love to connect with people at a distance and also because we know that there's a lot of folks in our community for whom uh, there are still accessibility issues related to in-person content. And we want to make sure that folks are included. Um, so if you're interested in our virtual event offerings, I would definitely encourage you uh, to check out our social media account um, or our website, sign up for our newsletter. We try and put that information out um, in all of those places. Uh, I know in the next week, we have a couple other virtual events that are gonna be really exciting. Uh, so definitely tune in for uh, a conversation with former political prisoners whose writings appear in a new book titled Rattling the Cages. Uh, and then after that, we're also hosting an online benefit for Heal Palestine uh, with two Palestinian American authors. Um, so, Tonight, uh, be aware, please, that we are using Zoom uh, as a webinar platform, and you can interact with us um, through the Q&A tool. So depending on whether you're on your phone or your computer, that's probably an icon either at the top or bottom of your screen, and it's going to allow you to kind of submit feedback or questions or things like that. And we're going to do our best to make some space at the end uh, to pick up as many of those questions as possible um, uh, to kind of... Uh, have a little space to interact. Uh, so anyway, we're going to get started here. Um, and I'll just give a little quick introduction for our panel. Uh, first up, uh, Zane McNeil is a scholar activist uh, from West Virginia. He's the editor of Y'all Means All, the Emerging Voices uh, Queering Appalachia, which I will say we did uh, a virtual event for when it came out. And if you're interested in that, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, Zane is also the co-editor of Deviant Hollers, uh, the book that we are gathered tonight to talk about. Uh, next up, uh, Tija Bumgarner is a filmmaker, scholar, and professor. She teaches narrative and documentary filmmaking at Marshall University. In 2017, she completed her first feature film, Meadow Bridge, a coming-of-age narrative set in rural West Virginia. Currently, she's collaborating on a documentary about the opioid epidemic in Appalachia. In both scholarship and practice, uh, Bumgarner seeks to disrupt stereotypes that conform to a single definition uh, defining that, excuse me, a, a single defining narrative of the region. Uh, Chet Pancake is an award-winning uh, transmasculine filmmaker, uh, video, new media, and sound artist. He's exhibited at national and international venues, such as the Museum of Modern Art, Wexner Center of the Arts, Royal Ontario Museum, uh, Murray Art Museum, Albury, Mexican Film uh, Institute, and Shanghai Conservatory of Music. Welcome, Chet. Uh, additionally, we have uh, Maxwell Klo, uh, who is a scholar of queer Appalachian art and archives. They operate the Wildcrafting Our Queerness Project, a digital exhibition of queer Appalachian art, oral history, and theory. Uh, they're an instructor of community studies at the College of William and Marys. And last but not least, Jessica Corey uh, teaches in the English department at Appalachian State University and is a PhD candidate specializing in Native American, African American, and environmental literatures at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. She's the editor of Mountains Piled Upon Mountains, Appalachian Nature Writing in the Anthropocene, and co-editor of Appalachian Eco-Criticism and the Paradox of Place. Her creative and scholarly writings have been published in the North Carolina Literary Review, North Dakota Quarterly, 
Northern Appalachian Review, and other fine publications. So really appreciative to all of y'all for joining us on this beautiful day um, to talk about a really provocative and exciting new book, uh, which I know folks in our community have been really uh, amped to pick up and start reading. So I'm going to pass off to you, Zane. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Liberty, and thank you so much, Firestorm. We were talking earlier, and I'm pretty sure it's my fourth time um, doing a book talk here. So in a lot of ways, I feel like Firestorm is my home and the people I'm most excited to uh, start this book launches with. So thank you. I'm really excited to be here with y'all today on Earth Day, and that was completely accidental. Um, but if anything, it's, it's so fitting. Uh, a few years ago, when... Uh, Becky and I started thinking through Deviant Hollers. We uh, were really interested in archiving queer voices, but then also connecting it to Appalachia as a space and the non-human animals and the environment that was there. And then also thinking about um, how do we do that when so many of us are, including me, are settlers. Um, and so much of what is Appalachia is caused by dispossession. And so and a lot of the main questions in Deviant Hollers is how do you queer a region that is, first of all, not yours, but then also um, you actively colonized? Uh, and what do we do to redress that harm, both for uh, our goals of having a, a queer liberatory future, um, as well as a sustainable one, um, and one really based on environmental liberation? And so Deviant Hollers is our conversation thinking through these really hard issues um, and thinking through ways to create these futures in really tangible, tangible ways. So I'm really thrilled to be here with all of our contributors um, who I'm also really lucky to have been friends with for a very long time um, in many cases and have worked with a lot of these folks on other projects as well. I'm a big fan of all of their work. And so the first thing I want to ask you and just hop on and, and unmute as, as you need um, to answer is, can you introduce yourself, you know, how you became involved in the project and what your chapter is about in Deviant Hollers? I'll go first. Beat everybody to the button. Um, so I became involved in Deviant Hollers uh, really because I, I, have a lot of scholarship that I've done and writing that I've done in Appalachian studies. And then my, you know, specialization, one of the major specializations in my PhD um, in English is, is native literature. And so I started kind of combining them in a way and saying, okay, how do we interrogate this place, you know, through a native lens? Like I'm a settler, you know, my, my family, you know, dad's side were like, owning farms before, you know, Cherokee or before Shawnee removal in Ohio. And so it's like, well, how do I, how do I come to that place, right? Of thinking like, how did they get their land? You know, did they still farm? Um, and, and, you know, what, what was going on here? And so just kind of interrogating that in my own space, as well as like, how do we do that as a region? Um, and so my particular chapter really looks at how can we know the ecology of a place, right? If we're not sort of at least paying attention to and listening to native voices, you know, in the region as well as writing diasporically um, kind of throughout it. Because you can't just come in here and say, you know, because I know a lot of folks, you know, it's like, oh, my, my family's been here for 300 years, but like, what is that in the grand scheme of things? You know, and so just kind of saying, you know, kind of taking more of a deep time philosophy for it, right? In a way, kind of querying how we think about time. Um, you know, and there have been some some rather problematic Appalachian scholars, who I'm not going to get a name at this point, but, you know, you can read my work and find out who they are, who have been like, oh, my people have been here since the beginning. And it's like, okay, but you're white, really? And so really even, and these are people who maybe were foundational to the field. And so it's like, how do you kind of challenge that, that idea of, of time and place um, in really kind of interrogating how we continue, as Zane was saying, how we continue to kind of build you know, queer futures in this space. I can go next. Um, so I came into this project, I guess when I was a master's student in American studies 
And I was writing my master's thesis on a, a bunch of things, but a lot of it being the intersection of queer Appalachian art and ecology. Um, my master's thesis, I was specifically looking at a handful of artists and talking about how they relate to Appalachia in these sort of Freudian terms as it relates to sacrifice zones and all that good stuff. Um, and then I was talking with Zane and he was mentioning he was putting this book together and I was like, oh, I'd, I'd love to contribute. Um, and so I took out some of that weird grad school Freud things. Um, and I eventually came out with what my chapter is, which is called, um, I fixed up the trees to give them some new life, queer desire, affect and ecology in the work of three queer Appalachian artists. Um, and in this chapter, I look at the work of three artists, um, Dustin Hall, who's an artist working out of Whitesburg, Kentucky, um, Charles Williams, who was an artist who lived in Blue Diamond, Kentucky, um, and then Beth Stevens and the Ecosexuals, which are a group um, originally based out of Montgomery, West Virginia, currently kind of worldwide. Um, and in this, I think through how art can challenge and inform our understanding of our relationship to the non-human natural world. Um, I employ a lot of Donna Haraway and the idea of nature culture, um, as well as the um, queer utopianism of Jose Munoz. I also, towards the end, think a bit out loud about what it means to decolonize Appalachia and what it means to exist in a world that's decolonized. And post like post decolonization, would the terms Appalachia and would the terms queer even be useful? Um, is the question I kind of wrap up with uncertain, like uncertainty with uncertainty. But um, yeah, that's my chapter, and I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, I, I could go. Hello. Um, so I came about writing this chapter thanks to Zane. He reached out, um, you know, being in West Virginia and small communities around here. And my chapter, it took a few different turns. It started off kind of as one thing, but mostly what I'm looking at throughout this chapter is being a filmmaker in uh, Appalachia, specifically in West Virginia. Like, what does it mean to play a part in representation? Like, what is your role in being an image maker? Um, specifically with documentary, although narrative, you know, is the same in that it is like this, you know, fear of ex exploitation and not just mining, you know, like coal, as we know we do here, um, but mining stories and mining identities and really trying to d dive into that and what that means for this space and how to look at Appalachia through this like idea of nothing of course is natural, um, nothing is normal. And so how do we kind of queer that idea in how we represent imagery and what that means. And so I struggled a lot with um, being, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm from West Virginia, right? But again, as we've already talked about, like what does that really even mean um, when you are still in a place that, you know, you're occupying and, um, thinking through if I'm making projects about a space, like how do I work with people that I'm making films about? And so I became really interested in the um, narrativizing of the opioid epidemic and what that means. And um, taking that from not just being, you know, I don't know about this one thing or showing what it is, but what can it do? And thinking about like the policies and politics that representation really gets tangled up with um and that power so how do we like again push against that dominant dominant narrative that we have in this region to get at something like more and i of course you can't have one answer i think it's really just a lot about asking questions and so i talk about in this uh chapter about making films in the space and like pushing students to think past you know just those single narratives um, and what it means to be, yeah, in a place, I think kind of sums it up. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thanks. That was, that was amazing to hear all you guys give your context. It's very, very cool. Um, I, I came, you know, I am from West Virginia, of course, too, um, from the Eastern Panhandle, and then I was born in Somersville. But, um, you know, it's interesting because I, 
I did, you know, I've done, I did a, a documentary about mountaintop removal that I, that I did when I was, I wasn't even out of the closet when I did that as a, as a gay female person, because I felt like I didn't want to get there while I was trying to work on this critical issue. It's very Appalachian. Um, and then I, you know, and I go back and forth between Baltimore and I was in Philadelphia and back and forth to my home and, and keeping in touch with what was happening in West Virginia. And I, you know, I did Black Diamonds and toured and went all over. And, and that was a very emotional, very exhausting piece um, that, but, but, you know, took me to certain places. And, and then I, and then I was working on a film called Queer Genius, which was sort of more about my urban experience and, and kind of recuperative. Um, my question for sort of like, they're sort of queer female artists um, who by nature of their work kind of can't be mainstream or, or sort of looking at queerness and art and maybe some of the, you know, the things that, that Maxwell's talking about. And that's, you know, on PBS now, like Barbara Hammer and, and Eileen Miles and, and Black Quantum Futurism is a really interesting group um, and Jibs Cameron. Um, and so in the, in the middle of, and I'm also an academic and um, it, at the end of, of Queer Genius, I was working with sort of like a lot of high resolution video and that was kind of tiring to me and started to feel kind of too much. And in, in the meantime, I had gotten this commission from University of London and Goldsmiths to work with the sociologists on uh, Citizen Sense, which was a project on fracking in Northeast PA. So based on Black Diamonds, they wanted to hire me for that piece. And I went to Northeast PA and I noticed and I started to become very interested in um, Vera Scroggins and having worked with Maria Gano and Judy Bonds and and knowing them for a long time. And, and I really was sort of like activists, activists really, particularly female activists, really move into spaces and move around spaces in their own way. And I was really kind of interested in like Deleuze and different things. And I was sort of more abstract, like what are these lines of flight and they're, the, you know, the, 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 the oil and gas companies sort of uh, go their own way. They do not follow the law and they do not care. And then these activists are kind of activated to respond in kind, but only a certain kind of activist. So I sort of become kind of obsessed with filming and documenting and doing my kind of work, but also like, what is driving these people? What is driving these particular women to really leave the social contract and move in their own way? Like, it's really profound when they do it. So I, I heard about, um, and then I was sort of tracking the arboreal blockaders at, at um, in Yellowfinch and sort of interested in, Going back and 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 checking that out, but in a very lo-fi kind of doing audio interviews and getting away from the high kind of high resolution film. You know, I wanted to kind of kind of away from the the, the film world and and kind of do some personal exploration. I was also starting. I think my body was starting to transition, whether I wanted it to or not. My body kind of started a natural progression of transition, and I was sort of following that. Um, and so and then so I'd been down. So I went down to the Yellow Finch and started doing these audio interviews only about some the somatic experience of activism. I was really concerned with the body and the individual and sort of their individual somatic states. And I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. But when I got there, there were lots of queer and trans people in the camp, which I did not expect. So then it sort of opened up a whole other door. Um, so then sort of the, the call for the chapter came across AppleNet or something. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually do know something about that. I should I should go and I should go there because I think I actually want to really explore this with other people communally, like what's happening. So um so I ended up using the kind of call and and thank thank you, Zane, for providing the platform. My God, because that was not available 15 or even a decade ago. This was not, a, I mean, you've done so much incredible foundation building for me and others to just kind of be able to ex express our interiority in this context. Um, but what, what I sort of started connecting with in the, in the, in the blockade um, uh, was sort of putting together um, uh, the, the, the kind of phenomenon, I became more interested in the phenomenological experience of activism, of Appalachian activism, and also of trans and queer people's experiences from the, the kind of, which is kind of, it's not really in fashion right now to talk about phenomenology, but I really was inspired too by Gail Salomon um, and sort of Sarah Ahmed. And I was sort of going back and looking at that philosophy and thinking about um, an Appalachian phenomenology. What is it about? We have some kind of, we are settlers, but we have some kind of unique relationship to our spaces <laughs> that that is ours and like personal, you know what I mean? Or whatever, but it is different from people who are raised in other places. And so 
and they get into and talk about indigeneity and is it is it appropriate to apply you know phenomenology like a like a, a continental philosophy you know how to you know to to an indigenous practice or, or trying to how can you be in co you know kind of in in coalition with people um when you're coming from these different philosophical viewpoints and also there was a lot of indigenous uh um uh collaboration at, at yellow finch it was one of the more diverse um uh um, and the impact of the impact of um, the Dakota pipeline was all in there. Um, and the, the, some of the activists had been moved in their bodies to leave places and be homeless. And they were they were they were sort of like their whole lives were changed by going to um, the Dakota pipeline things and seeing police brutalize people. So anyway, so that's kind of where I was coming from. So the, the chapter just gave me a way to kind of talk about all this stuff. And it was a really amazing space. And I felt so grateful for it because it, it is really what we're writing about is really specific. <laughs> I mean, I'll just say that out loud. We're writing you know, really specific things in a really specific culture, but it's a very American culture. Um, and it's been under a strange, I mean, we're always working under this, the 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 kind of the, you know, the 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 uh um concerted aspects of the uh, of the of the space. But I do and but I think that there's always been queerness in Appalachia. It's a very queer place. It's just it's hard to explain to people. <laughs> and so it, it gives one an arena to 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 you know to try to like. When you they say JD Vance, you have to like I can't you know how can I overcome you know how can I communicate with my own peers I can't I don't even know where to start with people you know um, so I feel like it's it's amazing and I and I see a lot of um, I'm so inspired and happy that um, so many young people are staying and rooting you know what I mean and 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 um, growing there yeah I think it's extremely hopeful I hope the climate change refugees don't like price everybody out at some point but um anyway that's where i'm coming from then thanks for the space thank you so much chet and everyone um well I, I started thinking through some of the questions that became this book uh in like 2018 i was actually in this queer ecologies class in budapest hungary of all the places and i was reading um all of these different theorists you know kate sandylands and mel chen um you know, Don Haraway and Anna Singh. And, and I was, none of them were about Appalachia or really the rural um, in general. And I just right away, I was like, these things connect, right? For me and my home and who I am, um, I, like these make sense to me. Uh, and so I was really interested uh, in looking at learning more about it. I found, you know, Ray Geringer's, I think, master's thesis now is one of the only pieces on like queer Appalachia that existed, like you said, 10 years ago, right? Um, because until very recently, it was really difficult for stories like this to get a platform. And that's, I think, what a lot of us in Y'all Means All tried to do was create an archive. Um, and this is sort of building on that archive to say not only do we exist in this space, right, but then really thinking through a lot of these really darker questions and trauma and connections to land and people and histories and, and thinking through accountability um, in very tangible ways. And in Ray Geringer's MA thesis, they had a quote from, I think, someone in Kentucky, um, I think it was part of the state project, but this person mentioned that, well, everything about Appalachia is queer to me, the rocks, you know, the, the animals, the land, everything is queer. And I had felt the same thing growing up in West Virginia. Um, and I wanted to build a whole collection, a whole conversation about that one quote from someone, right? Because other people outside of the region wouldn't see like this. And Becky actually pushed back on me, the co-editor at this and said, well, you know, yes, but also, there are so much histories of violence here too that you can't disconnect from those questions, um, and that that hold to be accountable to that um, from Becky was was really what created this collection um, between us. Really thinking through a lot of that tension, right, of us wanting to be free and autonomous and and liberated, but then also thinking about how we're so entangled in these histories and ongoing um, campaigns of genocide um here in Appalachia and and in other places and also part of that those questions right is yes the earth the Appalachian nature might be queer right but we also have completely extracted right so much of Appalachian economy is based on the extraction of natural resources like people mentioned fracking mining um oil all these different things and so I think Maxwell you had mentioned that you know Appalachia has been used as a sacrifice zone and that's something Becky and a lot of her work really talks about, 
And so, you know, we, I think we've gone around this question, but, you know, what does that really mean? And then why is Appalachia as a region important to center in conversations around environmental liberation? I think it's interesting, and I, I, I hope that other folks will get into this a bit more because I'm not as much of a environmental science person as I am more of an environmental studies person. But um, in a lot of ways, Appalachia is being used as a sort of ecological and physical sacrifice zone, right? There's people that are taking things physically, the ground, um, the resources, everything from the region to support the metropoles, right? We think about this, it's an outdated model, but there is sort of this sort of weird colonial relationship between the outside and Appalachia. Um, but I also think Appalachia exists as a kind of ideological sacrifice zone, right? If we think of a sacrifice zone as a place that we can trash so that other places can prosper. Um, we think about Appalachia being the scapegoat for everything bad that happens on in this country. It was Appalachia was center blame for Trump's election. Um, I'm sure Appalachia is at the blame for whatever kind of right wing emergences are happening right now, right? Um, and that kind of goes doubly so when we think about gender and sexuality. Um, uh, Jack Halberstone wrote ages ago that metro normativity centers queerness in the city. And so to be rural and queer is to kind of not exist. And when we think about the rural in American imagination, the imagination of America, Appalachia is kind of at the middle of that. We're like the ur rural of the United States. So what does it mean to be in this area and be queer after everything that in the national imagination has been just like destroying it and taking everything out of it, both physically and ideologically? Um, I think that's why Appalachia starts to get really interesting in these conversations, because there's nowhere in a lot of places in the United States that's more of a sacrifice zone than Appalachia, both physically and the sort of ideological way that I'm talking about. Um, so when we start to think about sacrifice zones in the United States, where do we get our things from? Who do we destroy in order to make ourselves who we are? Appalachia, in a lot of ways, is at the center of that. Um, and when we start thinking about colonialism and the d destruction of indigenous people, uh, which really be at the beginning of our thought there, it starts to get even deeper and deeper and deeper, um, which is why I'm so thankful for this book to kind of go into all of that. Um, I think like I would um, just kind of jump in with just, again, just what I know, not knowing, you know, all of the nuances of it, but thinking about Appalachia is a sacrifice zone with the opioid epidemic where just so much, you know, was just thrown into these very rural spaces. Um, I mean, it happens often. I know it doesn't show up in this uh, chapter, but thinking about how like the uh, recruits for military, so much of that happens within Appalachia and how like thick that is. And so it's always like the, you know, thinking about um, who's visible here so who matters here how does that like you know translate especially when you think about how those sacrifices then show up in power and policy and if you know we're told you know these things don't matter it is trash or just you know just this can be sacrificed then it gets really scary um to think about who then are the laws made for and I think we see that especially in West Virginia I was filming some of the legislative session and it's just like really disheartening to think about that um and you know within um uh, uh with my chapter you know thinking about this about the environment and how tied like we were saying like people are here in Appalachia like to this space but how yeah just problematic it is if you know when someone who is queer right if this in this sacrificial zone they do find themselves in active addiction how do they find like the resources that they need that are held in churches where they may not feel welcome in certain spaces or any other type of space you know and so I think that's part of where I see like my work trying to examine and trying to like find those gaps where you know the multiple stories can be, the multiple narratives can start to be like flourishing in some ways.
think especially with my work kind of looking at the intersection of, you know, kind of native studies and Appalachian studies, um, you know, from an environmental standpoint, it's interesting because when we talk about Appalachia as a sacrifice zone, a lot of times in Appalachian studies, it's like, yes, we're the sacrifice zone. And absolutely, I don't, I don't think anybody's going to refute that. But one thing that I notice is that sometimes it sort of erases other sacrifice zones that we don't always think about because, you know, think about like reservations. You know, they're, they're for a long time, especially citing um, like nuclear waste, they were approaching reservations, right? Because it's like, oh, hey, we'll, we'll pay you all if you just like let us put our, you know, your nuclear waste here. Um, and so often kind of reservations also, not always, but often very rural. Um, and again, find themselves in, in similar situations, um, especially thinking about like the atomic testing out West, right? So um, I was at a webinar and there was a Diné gentleman um, and he talked about his father remembering just the white ash. His father was a shepherd and they had their sheep out there and his father just remembers like this white ash coming down. And so I think that when we're talking about things like sacrifice zones, which of course are only made possible by, you know, capitalism in our, our lovely end stage capitalism here, right? But, you know, I think it's important to not only think about ourselves, like, yes, we're a sacrifice zone, but like, where else do we see this? And then what connections can we draw between those things, right? When we talk about, you know, environmental damage, or we talk about rates of addiction, like, do, do our communities have that in common with other Native communities? And could that be potentially a way to, you know, build solidarity. And I'm not, I, I know that also that could be seen as kind of what um, Eve Tuck and, and Kay Wang Yang talk about as like a settler move to innocence. And I'm not saying that's like escape accountability, but like if we're trying to build, you know, queer futurities, could we kind of, you know, connect on some of these things and push back against, you know, the powers that be that see us as just kind of sacrificial places and people. I think that's all like it's really interesting. And I, I feel like, you know, I know I guess I guess the place where I, I'm coming from recently is it has to come from through the body. You know what I mean? Because I and, and maybe and that comes from sort of the um just sort of the 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 kind of like you know, because it almost seems like where there where there are cultures where there is an openness to the land. <laughs> And there is a, not a concern in the culture necessarily that can happen in, you know, very like, kind of like different hollers in West Virginia or people are in that holler because they are connected to that specific place and that is their home and they consider every living being in the thing is kind of resonating with them, whether they can articulate that or not. And I think that that in in it, it it's sort of also an indigeneity, you know what I mean? Although they're, they're two completely sort of separate things and, and one has, you know, kind of a a subtle relation with the other but when when speaking of the the kind of um affect and emotion and i think this is where art is really helpful art and, and literature and film and poetry and music can be really helpful in that kind of um yeah, i think it's in those spaces that get the most exploited and i think of the opioid crisis as the in the interior ecology like it's a ripping out of the interior like the mountaintop removal ripped off the exterior and then opioids just ripped out the interior you know what i mean so i see i see that as in the continuum of the disruption of the person's experience and with their sense of touch and smell and taste and place um that is completely i, I keep going back to sort of really ponty because they're saying like they're trying to build a scientific um kind of reality around the, you know what the individual feels you know and they try it they did they didn't really arrive at the, at the heart the, you know the the science but that was sort of their their thing is sort of like can we get away from the cartesian and can we really start talking about the whole body that they're sort of it's a science too and it because i always felt this way with mount tarp removal or when like the citizens are i just kind of i go into this in the chapter but the citizens are are in pain you know what I mean? The people on the reservation are in enormous pain. They're in pain. They're medicating themselves. They can't, it's it's horrifying. Like their 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 bodies are being ripped apart by their disconnection with their environments being destroyed. And then that's never, you know, then that's completely belittled. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we'll start the science. Let's start that. Let's get the EPA in here. <laughs> and then it's just, you know, it doesn't, you know, so the 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 kind of hard science that's supposed to help um 
it doesn't and I I, I can't I, I did this kind of um climate change kind of um therapy group at the dope ecologies conference and it was pretty amazing and it was a diverse group of people some people from south asia some people from the united states really discussing in a very emotional way um they were sort of like let like stop you know because i i mountaintop removal and black diamonds was a very results-based practice like let's get results it's emerge it's an emergency we got to get some people in here and stop this stuff but they're sort of like do we need to connect more to get away from the results and the authority kind of thinking and really get into these networks of caring you know what i mean and like maybe i'm just getting too old but but i really have been thinking about that a lot in terms of what you're saying and and the more genuine connect i also because i live i've lived in predominantly african-american neighborhoods my entire adult life and um and li living next to people you know what I mean? I feel like I feel like it's 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 really living with others, people that you really start to feel that, you know, social and emotional. I don't know if that's that's the answer, but I I guess that would be my two cents for this book chapter is like sort of a um trying to find those um intuitive ways and then recognize that the the enormous amount of emotional pain and harm that 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 we can see around the sacrifice zones or around the, the, the abuse zones really um, that come up for people. Well, and thinking of what Jet was just saying about kind of the somatic experience or the experience in the body, you know, one thing that comes to mind for me, I, you know, I grew up in a paper mill town. So I grew up in Chillicothe, Ohio, which is about an hour equidistant from West Virginia and Kentucky. And, you know, they, they have a massive paper mill. I mean, absolutely massive. And one thing that I noticed, so my, my father died in September of lung cancer. He was a longtime smoker. Um, and, you know, I just was curious one day. I thought, you know, I wonder, you know, yes, he smoked for 40 years and that's not great. And we, we know all about that. But like, I wonder, you know, if he lived in an area with better medical care or, you know, I wonder what the paper mill is doing to the air, right? So I just got curious and kind of dived into the data because I'm a weirdo who likes that kind of stuff. And what I found out is that in that county, the rate of respiratory cancers, lung, esophageal, you know, anything kind of from like here to here, cancer rates were like double what they what the, they should have been, like anywhere else, you know. But non-respiratory cancers, you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, other things like that were actually about the same. So clearly, like, you know, when we talk about sacrifice zones, oftentimes it's like, you know, we think about like mountaintop removal or we might think about water pollution, but we don't often think about things because, you know, that are sort of tied to that capitalism, right? Like people are like, oh, we can't shut down the paper mill because that employs a ton of people, right? And what happens then? And so on and so forth. And so, you know, I feel like in some ways, you know, there's there's this kind of continuing um sacrifice that keeps on going as long as it kind of keeps fueling the capitalism but it, it might not be quite as obvious right like you always hear about people like yes we need to stop tearing the, the tops off mountains you know or or things like that but it's like things like water pollution air pollution where people are literally being sacrificed you know i mean again we can look at high cancer rates and and high rates of other other things and it's just it's wild to me you know because it's like how do you and i guess the, the question i always struggle with is you know, thinking about like an anti-capitalist approach, right? It's like, how do you, how do you sort of deal with that in these communities where like shutting down some of these pollution creating things would cause real financial harm? I mean, again, I didn't grow up in West Virginia, you know, but I know that mining pays a whole lot of money, right? In a, in a place where maybe your next best bet is, you know, like service work. And so I think that, that one of the things that I don't really explore this in the chapter, because then it would take a whole other chapter. But I think that this is one of the questions that kind of is a thinking about kind of if we start thinking about like queer economies, right, or or what could this what could this land look like sort of in an anti-capitalist sense? I always struggle with that. I don't know if anybody else, any of you have great ideas. And I, I know that was probably one of the questions we were going to cover. But like, how do you think that we we address the issues like you know, that kind of, well, people's jobs depend on this, but it's really problematic for these other ways. Is there a good way to do that in this region? I don't know. I've uh, been thinking a lot around toxicity, especially around factory farms in like North Carolina, right? Um, because a lot of those factory farms are placed in 
uh, Black and, and Latinx neighborhoods, um, and then increase issues like blue baby, baby syndrome, um, asthma, cancer, all that stuff, right? So these lagoons with all the, the manure, especially during hurricanes, run off and pollute the local environment, lead to algae blooms, who, which kill all the fish, right? And then also kills the people. Um, and Rebecca, Eli, and I, we wrote a chapter together in this book about toxicity and thinking through the toxic and disabling um, nature of environmental degradation as like a queering topic. Um, and we had also worked together on a piece around Duplin County, North Carolina and factory farms around the same premise. And I feel like so much of it, at least in that very specific case, is uh, finding sustainable economies elsewhere, right? Because especially in meatpacking and factory farms, like those are some of the most um, exploited uh, people, right? And so the capital people are making from these consumable bodies of non-human animals are not going to the people who are working there, right? It's going to outside agencies. And similarly, I, I, there's some really good nonprofits that I can share with you after Jess, because I don't know their name right now, but who do a lot of, of work um, in like black neighborhoods around San Francisco um, and, and the polluting agents of the boats that come in and out because these are usually black communities um, who don't get the, the wealth from these boats that come in, these ports. Um, but at the same time, is actually with some of the reasons behind the water going up that it's going to end up flooding these, this entire community, right, because of climate change. And so, so much of, of these specific instances illustrate the importance of like political education and organizing around communities, right? Like labor strikes in 2020 during this, the, the slaughterhouse workers and meatpacking workers um, was hugely impactful uh, on the, the, like they were literally dying during COVID um, because of the line speeds and being so close together. And similarly, the, the port communities in San Francisco um, they are, they've worked with urban planners to think through different ways to move goods um, as well as getting people on these councils. And so I think there's, when we're thinking through like sustainable economies and, and post coal futures and Appalachia and other sacrifice zones, a lot of it needs to be around having a strong labor force, right? Because what's good for the people who are working in these fields isn't what's going on right now. And they're really conscious about that. If anything, we've had a huge erosion of, of union um, participation, right? Because of state suppression. Um, and even, you know, with, with hot labor summer in the past two years, we're still at a very, very low union rate, which, if anything, harms all of us. So I think it shows how interconnected all of these issues around environmental degradation, you know, people who are needing to have stronger labor protections, as, as well as what we're seeing in a lot of, you know, the South and Appalachia right now around attacks on gender affirming care, um, trans youth in general, and then also abortion rates. So like all of these things are all connected, right? Um, and I feel like that's something this book tries to really illustrate the how capitalism and settler colonialism upholds a lot of the oppression that we see in extractive industries in Appalachia um, and what we can do to dismantle that by becoming in a lot of ways, you know, race traders, <laughs> even though I don't think we quite say that. Um, like in a lot, and if we're academics, class traders as well against the academy. Um, and so with Rebecca Eli's and I's chapter, we really rely on this term queer ecologies, which is very academic sounding and very messy and really inspired by people like Keith Sandylands, Mel Chen, like I was mentioning, Anna Singh. And so that was really the framework I wanted to create with around the conversations we have in the collection between all of y'all and the other contributors. And so, you know, how do you define queer ecologies in a way that makes sense to you and how you worked in your chapter? Um, and do, why do you think queer perspectives in general are important to eco-justice in Appalachia? I think I can kick us off because, oh, Chet, you want to get it? Oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to, I just had one follow up um, in terms of the well, one thing that I, one study that that was a, a normative kind of environmental study that I, I looked at in my chapter, um, and the 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 name of the researcher is slipping my mind right now, but but I appreciated the study. I, I critique. I, I was critiquing the study. That's that's sort of okay. I can only get funded for my research at WVU if I talk about citizens only. Like there are citizens, and they are the real ones. <laughs> And then everybody else, they have to you have to live next to the thing in order to have a legitimate voice in the thing, right? You have to live next to the pipeline, and be sort of you know, 
Um, and then another chapter was sort of um, about this range of different roles that that come together to sort of, it, it, there's a bunch of range of different roles of people that come together and constituencies that, because the Atlantic Coast pipeline was defeated, was defeated actually. And to be honest, like somebody that I know was one of the person who I found out wrote the the thing that got it defeated. And that person now doesn't live in, lives, it's a whole thing, but left their job because of it, because it was a very angering to the industry. But, but one of my critiques of it is, and one of the issues I think that when we're talking about it is that many people in Appalachia wear multiple roles. They're mining and they, they can be a coal miner. They can also, you know, um, be a nature lover. <laughs> they are also a hunter. And then they're also like eat a lot of, you know, can also love vegetarian. So I think that it's important for me too in, in, the, in the work to think about, because um, even in, in my work, it's sort of like people are, in other words, to employ, employ the connections and employ the richness of the individual to say, yeah, but it's con you, you, the people have internal contradictions. Like so many surface miners were weeping about their own land in another meeting in another county. S you know, somebody who's dealing drugs at the same time, trying to get their kid through college <laughs> because their kid's a musician. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I think being able to really see that complexity in people is, is helpful in terms of if there's any hope. I guess for me, it's sort of like, can you marshal the complexity? um uh you know of um seeing people as being multifaceted like i for instance personally like my uh, you know in the valley where my family farm is there's sort of people who go to liberty university there's people who you know what i mean who also um are very accepting of me for whatever reason <laughs> you know what i mean it's sort of like you know what i mean that it's it's a strange reality sometimes in our immediate communities when we're around like an Appalachian thing, it can and sometimes, sometimes not, but the the multi the, the the sort of thinking about and, and sometimes corporate this happens in corporate and just in my work in the tech industry. It's sort of like, yes, you have to employ Exxon to actually give you all the money to solve this problem in this community they they try to destroy. You know what I mean? It's sort of like sometimes you have to employ the system itself, you know what I mean? Or the or how can we or can you do that shrewdly? You know what I mean? As other people do in other, you know, urban areas to force um, the, the the people who are um, the bad actors to somehow be recuperative through a foundation. You know what I mean? But I guess I'm, I'm just saying, in my long like frustration with the same the exact things you're talking about, um, the, the 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 reality of um, that that somebody can be in five or six different roles. You know what I mean? Um, while they're even in their daily life experiencing those same contradictions that we're talking about as conflicts, you know what I mean? So I I, I don't know, I guess I just wanted to speak about that just a little bit because it it was occurring to me like in, in the, when I was writing the chapter, just that um, normative research and normative journalism just is not helping us. <laughs> It is not the storytelling is not helping us, you know, um, in terms of seeing people as multifaceted um, in our region. They're, they don't see they don't see people as multifaceted. They see them as these really specific roles that are all in conflict with each other. But anyway. Thank you so much for that, Chet. Um, yeah, I think especially when you see people outside the region write about people in Appalachia, it's very flat. Um, and people are utilized, uh, or I guess really weaponized as a monolith, right? And then has everything the, the journalist or the politician wants to write onto them and then use that. Um, so I think it's really important to, and I think uh, Davis actually mentioned this in the question and answer, and we'll do, but just how like it, it is really difficult to think about all of our roles as being part of like the oppressor and the oppressed or the extractor and the one who's being extracted from. Um, and that nuance is something very messy. Uh, and it's something that this book tries to really authentically think about, right? Um, so I really appreciate that. Maxwell, I know you have to hop off soon if you wanna jump on the question. Yes, definitely. Um, but yeah, so queer ecology, I think broadly is a term that really gets me excited. And I think about it a lot. So when I think of queerness, I, I see queerness as a kind of communal and affective and bodily use of desire, what have you, to dismantle things that we think are solid, um, namely binaries between gender, sexuality, what have you. Um, I think when we think about ecology 
and the environment, we're often thinking about the environment on those same terms, right? We're thinking about the environment as it relates to our bodies. We're thinking about the environment in relation to beauty and ugliness. Um, we're thinking about the environment as it relates to, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Think about our body as it relates to ugliness, as it relates to um, beauty, all of these things. Um, and when we think, when we bring queerness into it, we start to disrupt that distinction between the environment and all the things that we have tied up with that, and then also ourselves, right? Um, we often, it's easy to think of human beings as separate from nature. Um, we're these higher order animals. We live in society, we live in civilization and all that good stuff. Um, but I think when we bring queerness into it and we start to think about, hey, if these understandings of gender and sexuality and the way that we structure a family maybe aren't quite as stable as dominant forces would like to like us to believe, um, we can start to think the same way about our relationship to the non-human natural world that these sort of stabilities are not nearly as concrete as we would like them to be. Um, and I think queerness is also utopian. Um, it brings people together um, to think about a world that is different than our current world um, and a world that is often better and more egalitarian. Um, and so when we bring our thinking about the environment, I think queerness provides a really helpful way, as with art, I think through the aesthetic um, specifically, it brings about a way for us to imagine a new world and a new environment that we couldn't otherwise without queerness. And on that note, I have to skedaddle. Thank you all so, so, so much. Um, if you have any questions otherwise, um, like for me specifically, just you can text Zane and Zane has my information and he'll send them over. The best. Thanks, yes. Michael, for being with us. Thanks, guys. Did anyone else have to hop off at... I don't know what time it is in EST. Uh, I'm trying to do the map eight. <laughs> I think we're good. Oh, yeah, I'm good. There may be some dogs barking when people come home, awesome. but I'm here. All right, y'all, we're here for another 30 minutes then. And so we'll do 50 more minutes of, of questions with our contributors and then open them up to the audience. So please, I know we all, some of y'all have been in there already, but throw it in if you if you want to. Does anyone else have any comments on the queer ecologies aspect of it and why queer voices matter to environmental liberation? Well, I just think that again, you know, sort of queer ecologies is is inherently like anti-capitalist, like, and, you know, sort of anti-colonial. And so we really have to kind of think about upsetting those spaces um, because, you know, of course, you know, capitalism and colonialism are obviously linked and, there's plenty of, of scholars who are trying to like link, you know, sort of the beginning of widespread colonization back to kind of the golden spike that would define like the Anthropocene, right? So you have some folks like Lewis and Maslin um, and Zoe Todd and Heather Davis really kind of pushing for like, hey, you know, yes, the industrial revolution is a good starting point, but what might have spawned that, right? And so, um, it, I, you know, trying to kind of trouble the region in that way, um, I think is is really key if we're going to create a sustainable future, because frankly, those two things are not going to get us there. And so I think that, you know, if we're going to, you know, have a place for climate refugees to come and buy up houses, we're going to have to like, <laughs> I know that got dark, I'm sorry. But you know, it's it's like, you know, if we don't get away from kind of the, the rampant exploitation and consumerism and capitalism and, you know, the inherent greed and that's, that's kind of the basis for colonization, it's not going to matter where we live, right? It's not the places that we call home. That's not going to matter, you know? Um, and I, years ago, I was able to to interview Ann Pancake and, and she's a gem. I love her. But one thing she told me, because we were talking about being queer in Appalachia, and she said, it doesn't matter if we're queer if we don't have a home. And that kind of always stuck with me, right? Because it's like, especially as somebody, you know, as, as like rural, as a rural queer person, as, as, you know, being in community with other rural queer people, like, I don't want to go to New York City and like be queer in New York City. I visited there when I was like 20. If I was going to try to be queer in New York City when I was 20, I would have that would have been the chance, right? 
I'm not trying to do that then, I'm not trying to do it now. But you know, again, if if we don't kind of move away from some of these things, it's not gonna matter. You know, we're just gonna have to go wherever is not, you know, underwater. Um, and so I think that that, you know, is is sort of depressing is that thought is, you know, that's kind of what queer ecology is, is that, that this is gonna be our way out. You know, if we want to keep doing what we're doing, this is this is what we're going to have to do is really kind of trouble um, some of those some of those dominant narratives. It's funny that you speak about my sister because I came out at seventeen and she was still very straight <laughs> until she was forty. So I was the queer kid in West Virginia that was her uh, younger sibling, but. Um, so we, I did leave. We had to leave. I mean, there was nothing. There was nothing here. You know. I mean, I just escaped from Morgantown to to Baltimore, um, and um, and did that. But I think. Sorry, I didn't need to. Go there. I just had to bring that up. But but um, but I do think queerness is recuperative. And for me, you know, it's interesting because, and and um, and queer artists are very re recuperative. And I think that that when I did Black Diamonds, like, I mean, to, not to like. <laughs> I, this is, you know, I love what you're doing. It's amazing. This is like my little personal snit, but like coming out of Black Diamonds and like being, I mean, I had night, I was traumatized. I think I had PTSD after I made that film. I really do when I look back on it. And I would return to Baltimore and the, and my queer community, my queer cabaret and my queer community in Baltimore was the recuperation. You know what I mean? So, so again, I think you're absolutely right that queerness can be the recuperation um, and then it's also interesting to go back um, just generationally, because then my sister moved back from Seattle to West Virginia. Um, and, you know, now I'm trans and like now, you know, <laughs> I, I maybe I'll go back. I don't know. I still don't feel like I can. You know, I don't feel like I really totally can completely. And I have a non-binary child who requires, you know, uh, treatment. But um, and I love my sister. And I, of course, I'm remaking one of her stories into a film right now. And, and she's had enormous impact on me. But um, but I think it, it, going back to Yellow Finch, and I think the thing about this book is like for me going back to Yellow Finch and seeing trans and queer, because even in, in mountaintop removal, that people were starting to come in um, in maybe 20, 2000, 2008, 2009, I started to see more activists on the ground. I'd only worked with local people for like five years. So, and again, you know, in that project, there was no discussion of queerness at all. I mean, I was closeted the whole time because I just didn't want to disrupt the, the citizens with my sort of identity, basically. But I think that, that recuperation, so I think that the book is amazing. I mean, working with you guys is so amazing because it, it, whatever's happening with Zane or whatever's happening with this new wave of queer recuperation at Appalachia is, is amazing, you know, and the, and the people in this Zoom. Like, it, it is really new, you know. And, you know, and I think, you know, when I was, you know, coming out in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, we, but again, the the, the queer network of um, the drive from Morgantown to Huntington to Columbus, Ohio, we like, like, like the, the gay bars were the center of everything. And that's where we met everybody. And that was our recuperative scene, but it was based around alcohol. You know what I mean? So I think it's just really amazing. And, and I do think something new is happening. I, I you know, I, I, I've had so many more conversations, um, but I really am curious. Yeah. And, and for Tisha too, like, I think the queerness in Appalachia is extremely recuperative. Um, and I'm so happy uh, to be a part of it and to see it really happening. Um, <clears throat> and to feel a home. And I'm curious, I'm actually curious for both of you, how you're feeling about that in terms of home. Are you feeling totally rooted now? And like, this is it, or are you feeling like conflicted? Well, uh, I'm going to jump in really quick because I'm I'm from one part of Appalachia, but I live in another. And so, you know, it's it's interesting because most of my life, you know, I've lived in Appalachia. Save, uh, I went to, it was funny, Zane, you were mentioning the hog farms. I went to school in Eastern North Carolina. You could talk to my spouse who is from Eastern North Carolina. You wouldn't hear some hog farm stories and lagoons like us. But I, I lived in Eastern North Carolina for two years and I was homesick. And that's actually kind of what prompted Mountains Piled Up on Mountains because I kept thinking about the sort of, you know, Western North Carolina landscape and and Southern Ohio landscape and how, you know, they were kind of connected and similar in a lot of ways. So I, I lived in Eastern North Carolina for two years to get my master's and immediately moved to the mountains. 
of Western North Carolina, which I had never even been to. I just rented a cabin on Craigslist, like a weirdo. It was like, I, they could have been run by serial killers. Like I wouldn't have known. And I went out to the Western part of the, uh, the mountains and, and did social work for a couple of years. And then life happened and I ended up back East for about another three years until I got hired at Western Carolina. So I'll turn 40 this year. My birthday is this fall. And all but five years have been in different parts of the region, whether it was in Ohio or various parts of, of kind of North Carolina. I'm in like, currently I'm in the Eastern most um, Appalachian County in the state. I'm in Wilkes County. But again, you know, so I will say that it's, it's getting, I think, easier to be queer in these places. Um, you know, it's interesting because growing up, like my family, we were all just straight until like magically we weren't right. And it's like, you know, we, I joke around cause I have, um, you know, I, I have a, a niece and a nephew who are both queer and we joke around. We're like, man, when it's just our generation, like we're not even going to have like holiday parties. This is going to be like a, a gay pride parade down, you know, <laughs> like, until the but like, you know, um, because and, and I will say that I think there's a lot of hope simply because like my nephew is staying in Chillicothe and traveled, I mean, traveled the world doing AV for musicals and actually found that the companies that he was working for were actually less queer friendly than Chillicothe. And for that to happen, I mean, this is a place where like, I didn't, I, I didn't come out to my parents. I had, you know, some friends knew and some other folks knew, but it's like, you know, it's, it, they had their first pride parade a few years ago. You know, so it's getting it's getting a lot easier, I think, to be queer in the region. And I can't speak for for everybody else. Like, you know, I have a lot of my spouse is, is a cisgendered male. So I have a lot of kind of privilege there where people just assume I'm straight, especially if they see me with like our child. Um, so I do have like some kind of protections there that not everybody does. But again, hearing from like, you know, my nephew is trans and, you know, we have plenty of other queer folks in our family who have since come out over the years. And it's like, it's like, oh, it, it is getting, you know, somewhat, at least it seems like it's it's at least more acceptable, um, you know, and I, and I think that that's, you know, true of maybe it's just younger generations or, or I don't know what's driving it necessarily, but it seems like it's getting to be a place where, you know, you can be queer um you know and and still stay home and the reason i don't go back to ohio has a lot to do with like you know jobs and air pollution um you know but i'm glad that like my family is still there and is able to be safe in that place um i think what's really exciting at least for like my position being at marshall like we're in you know in appalachia in west virginia and the work that my students are willing to make um, and expressing themselves, showing themselves, and really dealing with what that means to be queer in Appalachia is just beautiful. And I guess it feels just so just like, yep, it's like secondhand, you know, and I think it's because I'm in the School of Art and Design, you know, and there's uh, just a really strong community. And I had someone reach out recently who, um, her uh, son is trans and asked me about what is it like? And I'm like, well, I can't speak of course for, you know, all aspects of it, but that the community seems pretty strong, um, at least that I'm around with the filmmaking students. Uh, and also there's just some really great things that I see happening. I've started working with um, the ACLU with um, work on a documentary about the Appalachian Queer Youth Summit that happens in West Virginia. And like, that's just been beautiful. I was there last year and we were, you know, filming some interviews and just having like these different places and pockets, I think is really, uh, yeah, it's just something awesome to see. And, you know, I'm grateful that that's there, especially for the youth to feel like, cause you can feel like everything's against you sometimes here in West Virginia. Um, and so to have like some of that reprieve in those spaces, I think is really really important and I think highlighting that and so the more like projects that I can get my students to want to show um you know fights against those that monolithic narrative and kind of these sensationalized ideas of what this place is through mass media to you know really be able to like share that independent work that they're making so I think 
yeah, that's what I'm seeing. And so it is hopeful. And I think that's really, um, yeah, really important for the region for sure. I feel like with the all means all, a lot of it, like I mentioned before, was about building an archive and saying not only do we exist and survive in Appalachia that we're here, but that so many of us thrive as well. Um, and it's difficult because uh, we were talking about this before the the book talk started, but there's so much idealism in the all means all, and it's it's very jarring to see the difference in our conversations um, in just two years, really, between the all means all and now, right? Because you know as I, I touched on there's half, almost half the country now has banned um, transgender use access to gender affirming care. Um, so many of them have sports bans, um, you know, don't say gay laws, uh, just a myriad of things to make fair youth lives harder. Um, and I was doing a, a book talk at a West Virginia university with a few other contributors about y'all means all and a college student, you know, 18, 19 asked me, well, you know, how do you juxtapose, juxtaposition um, your idealism in this book and your optimism and your your commitment to queer futures, you know, and then what we're seeing in our lived experiences politically, legislatively, um, and the rollback about body autonomy and, and our rights. And I think holding those at the same time is really important because I, I too have lived in Baltimore and DC and, and Denver, you know, and all these other places. Um, and I haven't I've experienced more transphobia, you know, in my Denver law school, <laughs> my liberal arts law school than I have anywhere in West Virginia. Um, and so much of coming home is so freeing to me and, and so safe feeling. And so much of what y'all means all was, was us finding our vocabulary to have a queerness and transness that made sense to us. So it wasn't metronormative, right? Um, and a lot of that was really born from work that happened, you know, in, in 2016, 2018, and being able to find a just a, a language for ourselves that made and a community that made sense for us and and claim it, um, and especially since there weren't platforms there, and so much of my work has been able to try to fight for the space for us to define ourselves, um, and then also in my my writing and my journalism uplift those stories that is always are always being repressed right and those nuances and those tensions and those contradictions like we've all mentioned is really what makes deviant hollers um and all these other work that we're all doing um come to life right because it, at its heart deviant hollers is a love letter right uh because i'm i'm not a west virginia right now and i'm going to come visit but there aren't jobs there, you know, unless I want to work in truck law, because there's a lot of truck law, but that's it. Um, and so what does that mean, right? You know, and a lot of y'all means always thinking about being an expat and being away from land. And so much of Deviant Hollers is thinking about that relationship, but really also interrogating it and, and disrupting it and thinking, well, what can you claim? And is and how does a claiming a space also part of colonizing it um, and how to be ac accountable to that? And so with that in mind, Liber, we have one time for one more question, right? Go yeah, go fast. for it. Okay, we go really fast. Okay. So this one's, I'm going to throw in two into one. So just pick out what you want. But I think, you know, in Deviant Hollers, we really think about why it's important to address and disrupt American exceptionalism, white supremacy, settler colonialism, capitalism in Appalachia. So, you know, how do you bring these critiques into your chapter? And then to not end in a depressing point, you know, what sort of queer Appalachian ecological futures can we imagine and what tangible steps can we make towards those futures together? You know, I think it's, I think that the relationship with land is, is sort of, I mean, that's sort of like, you know, in our family, like, Yes, we were we were some of the original settlers, you know what I mean? Like, yes, were there enslaved people in our land? Yes, there were. Have they been in touch? The ancestors, yes. You know what I mean? Like it's it's really going down, right? You know what I mean? Like it's really happening. People are the, the history's coming up through the ground. Um, you know, everything's coming to a reckoning point. You know what I mean? What is my relate what is our relationship to you know the land and how do how are we um yeah, that's very personal in terms of, you know, and it's interesting too, because the queerness is a recuperativeness as, a, as, as, you know, connections with people across an ecology, connections with people and community across ecologies where we're not uh, building bridges and exploiting, but we're building joy and pleasure and, and, and connection with it, you know what I mean? In a way that's not exploitative, I guess those are things that come to mind. And also letting go of, how do you, how do you, how do you keep your sense of place 
letting go of your sense of ownership. I think that's one thing that I've been really working on. And I know like my sister Anne has been working on too. Um, I mean, Anne's, Anne's kind of, I said, what, what's going to be your, you know, new year's resolution. She was like more feral than ever. <laughs> more feral, just get more feral, everybody. That's Anne Pancake's note. But you know what I mean? But I think that there's truth in that. That's queerness too. You know what I mean? Because we, you guys laugh because you know what I'm talking about. When we say get more, like, throw off, you know what I mean? Whatever, you know, conventions you thought you were going to have to be a middle-class white person in America, just get rid of them because they're not helpful anymore. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that'll be my last note. But again, I think that the, yes, how, how to can retain the connection with the ecosystem that came from our parents, that came from our grandparents stewarding it. I mean, it's, it's still there because they did that. They did not leave and they took enormous decades of their labor, you know what I mean? And then now we have to kind of, you know, how do we release it? I love that, they get more feral. That is amazing. Um, and But to think about kind of what you were talking about, about the land stewardship um, and, and kind of being of place, without owning it. And I think that's a really interesting thing because um, what happens a lot, I'm sure you've all seen like, you know, the, the land back movement, right? And in, indigenous, um, you know, various indigenous activists, scholars, um, you know, one of the big fears that sometimes you hear is like, well, you know, if we give the land back, because I saw this the other day, somebody was like, well, if we, if we give the land back, are you just gonna like kick us off of it? And they were like, we're not you, you know? And so I think when somebody asks about kind of tangible steps, um, you know, one of the things that I can think about, because my chapter focuses a lot on kind of, uh, you know, thinking about how do we think about Appalachia through like an anti-colonial or decolonial lens, right? Um, and just thinking about tangible steps, one of the things you can we can do is like support, you know, indigenous activists that are working on land back. There have been a lot of big wins where various peoples have, you know, gotten stewardship over their traditional homelands. You know, there's been a lot of, you know, thinking about on the koala boundary, you know, a lot of people mistake the koala boundary as a reservation. It's not a reservation. They bought back their stolen land from the government, which is a different kind of scenario because a reservation is where the government holds the land in trust. Um, and so even though when you drive onto koala, there's a big sign that says like, welcome to the reservation. Like it's actually not a reservation, um, you know, and so, I think, you know, really kind of supporting indigenous artists, indigenous activists and scholars in these, you know, efforts, you know, and also not trying to take the front seat, you know, which I think is something really important is like settlers. It's like, you may mean well, right? But like, you know, amplify people, support people. Like, don't, don't go in and try to be like, I'm gonna do this. Like, no, you're not. Have about a dozen seats, you know, and listen for a minute. And I think that that, you know, those kind of things are tangible, right? You can absolutely like support folks who are doing this kind of work um, without kind of putting yourself in the limelight and, and trying to kind of make it your own project. Because again, there are people doing this work. It doesn't always have to be like, you know, I know in Appalachia, right? We're like, I have bootstraps, I can do this. And it's like, actually, there are people doing this. You can just, you can just help them. And I think that, you know, for some of us like white settler Appalachian people, it's like, Oh, I don't have to, I don't have to kind of spearhead this, right? So that's just something to, to kind of think about as far as tangible steps. I uh, absolutely agree with the idea of like amplifying the work that's being done. And I do like, you know, teach a documentary making class. And so I think that, yeah, there's a lot of potential in there. Again, what my work deals with is thinking about representation um, and not in this chapter, but in something else that I've written, you know, I talk about like tourism. Um, and so definitely think about ecology and tourism, how like the, the ugly, like Maxwell brought up, is like hidden away when you're just driving through these beautiful mountains and this just right over the ridge, that's where they ripped off the top of the mountains and, you know, they want to hide that away. But I think that's even more visible now. It's very visible. And I, I think just to consistently work within like yeah the visibility of the multiple stories and what that means and amplifying what is being done um you know again just thinking about what my part could be in in that space and um working toward that and trying to make those connections and to yeah work with again i think the youth are the ones 
that I hope to kind of reach within that space of really challenging those historical concepts and being able to, yeah, fight for that, the, the, the vision of what this place could be and hopefully will be. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and we have two questions, so I'm gonna read those. If anyone else has any, please, there's still time to submit. Um, I'm gonna read the second one first, uh, especially given that many communities of color have been faced with gentrification by white queer communities. How can white queer communities doing this work in Appalachia incorporate accountability, reparations, and healing of settler communities? It's a really good question. It's really happening. Like people are finding their ancestors and coming, you know, this is really, it's, it's again, it's supporting people who are um, recognizing where their ancestors were living and who's living there now and how they're going to approach people and how that's approached and how those things are going to go down. I think it's a really open question um, in terms of um, connecting people and, and, and sort of you know, there are also, again, a different foundations that, that do work through and different groups that do help people work through um, how to, um, yeah, how, how to how to figure out what people need, what people want, um, how the reparations can happen. Um, I believe in reparations through a tax code. I think that reparations should happen through, that, that, that should happen through taxing. There should be a tax and it should be paid and, and people should be, you know, you know, should receive the 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 cost of the labor of their ancestors. I think it should it should happen tomorrow. You know what I mean? There's no reason it can't. You know what I mean? Would not be hard to do. Um, again, again, too, if it's like a, a general shared tax. Um, but I think that um, just being aware and being open and really looking historically at, you know, uh, figuring out genealogically who's where and what's what and it's a lot of work and families are doing it and they are really putting it together but I think in terms of working with historians and um, helping people sort out where their ancestors were it's it's just a, it's a lot of work actually and and um, I'm grateful for uh, families that have contacted our family and we've been working on that and it's an open, ongoing conversation. You know, what do people need and want as per the family and who's coming and who's making those reconnections? Um, and I'm grateful that it's happening. And, um, you know, and I think it's it's complicated, but I, I'm, I'm grateful for people who are doing that work and looking at the censuses and figuring out who was where, you know, and what happened. I mean, it, it really, need, it was never redressed and it needs to be redressed. That's my comment, I guess. Jess or Keisha, do you have any? Um, I'm just thinking about, for example, like my uh, my dad's family that lived in Southern Ohio um, did not, they, they were not slave owners. In fact, they went to Ohio because they were living in Kentucky and they were like, we don't like slavery. We're going to Ohio and we're going to get a farm there. Um, but I think still thinking about how did you get that land, right? What do you do with that knowledge, um, you know? like kind of coming to terms with that you know do you at some point give the land back do you you know sell it to only certain people yeah I don't have all the answers for that but I think that you know when we think about reparations I absolutely agree with Chet and I and I love his plan and if Chet wants to become president I will absolutely vote for that um you know but I think we also have to think about you know who else should be getting things here like what else has settler colonialism destroyed you know, who else has been impacted by this, uh, you know? And so I think that there's a lot of, a lot of avenues there for redress that are certainly worth um, looking into to kind of, kind of, you know, make reparations in a lot of different ways. Yeah, so I feel like mine is, I feel kind of one dimensional, I always go back to like the power of film. Um, but I feel like that's what I have to sort of work with. And I know um, like last semester, uh, Black by God with Crystal Good came in as uh, one of our clients. And so students like they learn a lot about these issues and like what's happening through making work for folks who can hopefully then utilize that to, you know, try to share those stories. 
Um, and again, I think, you know, again, depending on what I can do, like personally, to try to help and do that is using the power of, of film and video to um, amplify what needs to happen. And then we can also, yeah, make those presidential uh, videos for Chef there. That'd be great. Thanks, Neil. That actually goes really well into the, set, the last second and then the last question. Um, the question is about how research itself can be a sort of extractive uh, relationship between the person who's doing it and then the person who is the interviewee or the person, the subject of it. And so how do you see the path forward for us as Appalachians capable of addressing and yet transcending that narrative, even as writers, academics in the region to name it and to move on beyond it? So there's a lot of that in, in Native studies. That's my child. That's my child. Can't what? Stop I'm sorry. And so what I will say is that, you know, that's been a big issue um, in Native studies, right, with the, the kind of the extraction of knowledge. Um, and so there's been a lot of uh, movement for Indigenous data sovereignty. And so essentially, you know, in working, one of the biggest things that I, I think also applies to doing any kind of research writing, et cetera, about Appalachia, is that you need to work with communities. You cannot just go in and take some pictures and get your poverty porn and fly out. And I'm gonna have to explain what poverty porn means in about 10 minutes. But you know, you can't just go in and do those things and leave. And it's also true of, of indigenous communities, right? Like anthropology, you know, I'm sorry if there's any anthropologists in the audience, but like super, super problematic for that reason, right? Because it's like, oh, we'll go in, we'll study people, we'll write down stuff and then we leave. And I think the other thing that comes out of kind of doing research in Indigenous studies, um, you know, is that you also have to make sure that the people in the community are benefiting from it and that you're doing something that they want you to do, you know? And so I think that that can also be true for Appalachia. You know, if you come into an Appalachian community, how are you benefiting the people there? What projects are you helping with that originate you know, in their communities that they have ideas about, you know, it's not about coming in and saying, I have this idea of what would, you know, like, I'll give an example. My spouse went on a mission trip with his church to West Virginia to put like roofs on houses or something. And, you know, it's great. It's wonderful. What have you, but like, do those people specifically ask you to put roofs on? I mean, I get it. Everybody might need a roof. Right. But like, did that idea originate with that community or are you just kind of flying in to make yourself feel good? You know, are you just flying in to get that line on your CV? And I think that we really need to be focusing on as scholars and artists and activists, you know, and just people like, how is what we are doing benefiting a community? How is it meeting the needs that they, that they express that they have? And how are we working together? You know, how are we kind of doing it in a cooperative way? Uh, one thing I will add to that because this is something that I struggled a lot with when you know I'm working on my doctorate and then I'm like wait who am I making like I was working on my first narrative set in West Virginia and then I went to Appalachian Studies Conference and we're kind of like all sitting there in our bubble and we're like oh yeah we already all think this I was like my uncle Keith he's the one that needs to be here like he doesn't know any of this about this place or why we think this or why he thinks he's so bad off and you know like a lot of those like complicated and I was like well how do you reach folks, you know, in those spaces? And again, film is very powerful. Um, but I think too, like in my like working through that, so this documentary that we just completed, which is a feature uh, length documentary, it deals, you know, we're following a family and substance use disorder with substance use disorder. Um, and there's a lot of complicated backstory with this project and things that happen. I grew very close to this family. Uh, we are like family um, now and we went through a lot together but what we do now like the mom who's in the film she's a producer on the film and helped us to finish it because we sadly lost uh, her daughter uh, during the making of the project and so what we do with this film is we offer narcan training fentanyl strips you know um, we do any kind of like recovery resources that we can and so trying to find like those ways of we're working within this community, but then able to kind of give back and like share this story, but also offer what those resources are. Um, and that's how I think we've kind of negotiated what 
because documentary can be really difficult. It can be gross. It can be really complicated when you're telling someone's story. And so I think that's part of what, yeah, of trying to not be that doing that mining, you know, um, type of work, but working with the, within the space and with folks. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. We're sort of like in the, I, I will say in the, in the Citizen Sense project, there were the, this, the Jennifer Gabriel, who I worked with, with the, from the European Union, there, there is some really innovative stuff of allowing, trying to allow citizens to own their own data, to collect their own data. That whole project was sort of about um, allowing citizens to, to, to collect their samples and share it in a shared database and have ownership of it. So I think, you know, there's sort of, there, there are sort of people who are working really hard, even in the environmental kind of sciences to get away from this thing if you go in and extract all this data and it, it throw it somewhere and nobody sees it again and giving people ownership of the of the um I mean in the in the when I went down to to um work with the arboreal blockaders I did the, give them the camera they shot themselves you know sort of like the other quote of self-portraits and um I, I I I do really love sharing agency and creative practice um Sometimes that's harshly critiqued, you know, and that's considered not expertise, you know, but I really love it. And I'm, I, I am personally like kind of have to feel I need to do that in, 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 in projects where you're really, um, where you are coming into a space and you're kind of curious and you're there and you can give back to people. You can give them the interview, you can give them the thing, you can give them the images. Uh, I think there's really astute ways to do that. Um, that can be interesting. Um but I think that 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 yeah, it's it's uh it's been a it's just a classic problem that, that we all know about at Appalachia. It's a very uh it's a very ongoing issue. Hey y'all, I'm coming back in to um to bring up the fact that we've been going for about 90 minutes. It's been an incredible conversation. Um and I would love to be able to continue it. Uh, but I think out of respect to um, all of y'all who have committed your evenings um, and to our audience, we should probably wrap up. Zane, do you have any other final thoughts that you want to share as we kind of close out for the evening? I just want to thank all the contributors and Firestorm and the attendees for being here. Um, I'm really thrilled to have this conversation and be able to have these really, especially because it's very difficult, I think, for all of us um, to think through some of these really challenging concepts. Uh, and I, I think it means a lot to see utopic thinking and futuristic forward thinking, um, despite all of the trauma we're all going through right now that in a lot of ways unnamed. So thanks for holding space with us, y'all. Yeah, thanks email, so much, everyone. Yeah, email anytime. I mean, happy to have personal conversations, very happy. Awesome, and I just wanna encourage everybody who hasn't picked up the book yet to grab a copy. If you found the conversation tonight to be generative, um, there's, so many great pieces in this book um, definitely deserve space uh, to space in your life. So, so grab your copy either from us or from your local bookstore. Um, you will not regret it. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Firestorm. Thank, thank, thank you, so Liberty. Firestorm. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, y'all. Thanks. You Take too. Care. Yeah, thank